What's up, everybody? Welcome to Kind of Funny Games Daily for Wednesday, March 21st, 2018. I'm one of your hosts, Greg Miller, alongside returning co host Christian Phillips. Woo! Yay! Great to have me. Great to be here. Uh, if somebody's seeing this for the first time, they don't know who you are. They somehow missed your titular performance on Christian. Kind of funny games daily. You like <laughs> yeah. what I did there? Toss that, that in there. Nice. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. you. Uh, what would they know you for? What, what's your role here in the video game industry, Christian? Uh, uh, general vagabond at the oh, moment. Oh, okay, great. Okay. But yeah, no. Uh, yeah, it's actually kind of cool. I, I realized that um, uh, today's actually my 25th wedding anniversary. Glad you're celebrating it with me. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, dragged my poor video game uh, widow yeah. up uh, from San Diego. Uh, most people probably know me from my time most recently. Uh, last 13 years, I ran the San Diego studio yeah. in charge of MLB The Show. Sure. Um, other great hits in the past, like uh, no, you're doing fine. My Nation Racers. Get right there. Fuck yeah, My Nation right. Racers. You know that. Yeah. Um, sports Champions, and then a um, handful of other titles that... You know, maybe you slip through some cracks, but Starblood Arena, PlayStation VR, one year anniversary coming up too. Wow. So that's crazy too. Yep. So that's yeah, and then I, I, I actually, uh, Sony and I um, parted ways just over a year ago now. Yeah. And um, for the last year, I've been with the guys at White Moon Dreams, okay. um, and came on as a partner there and the president at White Moon. So what are you guys working on? Well, we're working on a couple unannounced yeah, uh, yeah, almost projects. Had you, almost had you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but um, no, so, uh, some good stuff. Uh, we've got uh, something that we're that we're self funding and we're, we're shopping and some pretty advanced talks. It's an action RPG. Um, oh wow! Okay, uh, we'll start off in the PC space. So we're pretty excited okay, about that. Okay. And then, uh, yeah, you know, we're still dabbling in PSVR. We've got um, we do uh, a lot of work in China. Yeah, so we've got. Uh, some things cooking. We're we're okay. pretty excited. GDC's uh, been very fruitful. Yeah, yeah. Good. So it's been great. What what is it like for you as a developer to be at GDC? You know, I mean, I think that's one of the things we've had a, a bunch of different hosts on so far. But there, you know, it's Khalif, it's Danny, it's going to be Jason Schreier tomorrow. There are more people from my world. For sure. you as a developer here, especially somebody who's like helping not start something new, the company was going, but like you know, do something brand new, make these new IPs or new video games. What is it like to go to GDC? What is it? What does a day, GDC day look like for you? Yeah, no, uh, great question because I've been actually ruminating on this a lot yeah. this week because it's been such a polar opposite experience this year. Really, right? a, a well, brand I, new game developers conference for you? Yeah, it, it really is. You know, I used to always just kind of feel maybe borderline out of place as a publisher coming yeah. to GDC and and you know obviously taking meetings and and hearing great pitches and meeting with with developers, but it's. Um, it's a far different show for me this year. Mm. Um, we, I'm not getting onto the show floor or into any of the panels or the, the talk, so I'm going to have to stream all that stuff after the fact. Yeah. But yeah, so for us, this has just been nonstop meetings, um, which is great, yeah. obviously, because yeah. you know, we only eat what we kill, so... <laughs> You know, we, we need as many meetings as we can. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I feel that's when people talk to me about GDC and I'm talking about a, a fan, a best friend watching the shows. I think they're like, well, is it like E3? And I'm like, no, no right? Like to me, I, this is about camaraderie. Right. Uh, one of the things that's been great for me this week is being able to reconnect with, you know, I've, so I've been married 25 years, but I've been in the industry 27. Oh, wow. And so that, you know, I started at Nintendo, um, I was at, my, at Microsoft as well, and so I have all of these friendships that I've made over this time, and GDC is the place where you get to make, you know, reconnect with those people. Yeah. And uh, really, uh, for me, this week, too, has been inspiring as I've been talking to other devs and hearing what they're working on and some of the struggles that they're having sure. that you know, uh, mirror the things that we're going through. So that helps. Yeah. You know, misery loves company sometimes. Yeah. 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 yeah I was at day of the devs talking to some people last night and one of them was putting is like, when, when we're here, our guards are down. Like, you know what I mean? It yeah. is this thing of, it's not the bravado of how you're doing or how big your team is or this project. We can't tell you about it is very much like you're over beers with people, you know, and maybe they've brought friends you don't know well, but you know, if they think you're cool, that's cool. Blah, blah. And it is the man, this is not working for us. And we have this thing and it's been going right, but now it is not going great. Now Absolutely. we figure this out. Yeah. And publishers, we talk about you. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a lot of that going on. <laughs> yeah, for sure. You know, it's not a marketing event. Right. Yeah. Uh, say, E3 is a sales and marketing show um, with obviously amazing content present. And, sure. And the devs are there in support of that. But that's really their show that we as developers go to support. But yeah. This is ours. 
Okay. Yeah. Well, Christian, I'm happy to have you back. Well, thank the you. The stars aligned to give us a lot of industry news. Yeah. So there's stuff for you to talk about on a thing that I think we'd all be like, all right, cool. I don't know what that means for the industry. Is somebody trying to make stuff? But you'll have stuff to say because this is kind of funny games daily. Each and every weekday on a variety of platforms, we run you through the nerdy video game news you need to know about. If you like that, you need to be part of the show, kindoffunny.com slash KFGD. Put in your questions, comments, concerns, bad PSN names, new segments, and everything else under the video game sun. Then you can watch us record it live, twitch.tv slash kindoffunnygames. If you're watching live, you have a special job. It's to go to kindoffunny.com slash you're wrong and tell us what we screw up as we screw it up. However, today, Comcast has shit the bed. There is no <laughs> internet in our area of San Francisco, so there will be no your wrongs. You are free to correct us for tomorrow's show, but I probably will not read it unless it's a megaton we screwed up and said something like, Phil Harrison runs Xbox. Because I've been known to do that. Ooh. I slip in. The, I knew Phil Harrison so well. You know what right. I mean? He was out there talking about Little Big Planet for so long. And yeah. SingStar and Game 2.0. Yeah. He was ingrained in here. Flipping the switch of Spencer's heart. What do you think now that he's at Google? I think they're going to get hard about games pretty soon. They're going to have something to say. I'm pretty excited. Yeah? yeah. What do you think it's going to be? Is it going to be a console? Is it just going to be a platform? Uh, I think... I. <laughs> I'll, I'll be interested to see if maybe it's not more um, about uh, trying to impact lifestyle. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Bring games right. to everybody the Google way. Yeah, it, or maybe to, you know, um, leaning towards maybe some of the stuff that, you know, Jesse Shell is the most famous about talking the ga about the gamification of life. Sure. Right, and bringing that um, from a mixed reality perspective. Mm -hmm. Right? So, yeah. I mean, you can't forget Google Glass did kind yeah. of come and go. But I, I hold out hope. It's that probably in the background still. I hold out hope that the next time they come out for Google Glass, it's going to be like, cool, and we've partnered with Warby Parker, and this is what Google Glass looks like. It isn't this weird little right. tiny overlay with this giant battery pack. Because yep. if it was glasses, I would be all in. I would yeah. love to have a heads-up display like that. Yeah. Yeah, I digress. So anyway. Even when the internet's down, we post the show over on youtube.com slash kind of funny games and podcast services around the globe, including Spotify. Housekeeping for you. There's a new party mode up. It features up, up, down, downs, Austin Creed, a.k.a. WWE superstar Xavier Woods, a.k.a. the commish. You can go get it right now. Patreon.com slash kind of funny games. It is an amazing edit that made me very proud to know Andy Cortez. It would mean a lot to me if it would mean a lot. Yeah, that's right. It would mean a lot to me. Me if you went to patreon.com slash kind of funny games and gave us just that buck that gives you a whole bunch of other access early things to watch shows and all sorts of stuff but gets you party mode today and of course that means that the PUBG one from last week is now up on youtube.com slash kind of funny games click the bell so you never miss a video as awesome says a lot <laughs> and we're sponsored by Brooke Linen and hymns but I'll tell you about that later for now cool Greg let's start the show with what is and forever will be the Roper Report. Do, 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 Time do, 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 do. for some news. Four items on the Roper Report. A baker's dozen. Thank you. Number one, <laughs> ID at Xbox is planning to, add, or already did, added 300 indie games in a year. This is via gamesindustry.biz, who will pop up many a time in this episode. The ID at Xbox program is approaching its 800th title, less than 12 months since it hit number 500. ID at Xbox director Chris Sharla revealed the figure in an interview with GamesIndustry.biz ahead of his talk at this year's GDC in San Francisco. ID at Xbox is the name for Microsoft's initiative to attract and support independently made games on Xbox One and Windows 10. It was announced in August 2013, and the first game arrived in April 2014. The first 500 took just over three years to arrive. Although the number of games hitting the platform pales next to the number of games arriving on Steam and smartphones, it highlights just how fierce the competition is becoming on consoles for indies. Quote, for developers, discoverability is always going to be a super important issue, Charla acknowledges. It's something we talk about all the time in terms of when to release a game, when to announce a game, how to announce a game, how to show a game before a release. That's a situation that's constantly changing. The formula that worked five years ago or even 18 months ago might not work today. So we just have to tell developers what the latest trends are, whether it's announcing super early or announcing closer to release. So we just share everything we know. That's a lot of games. It's a ton of games. Is what what is you what problematic? You, yeah, when you look at it, I was going to say, what does that say to you? Eight hundredth title. Well, if I was um, one of those, I, you know, additional three hundred that were coming in. Yeah, I, uh, I mean, I appreciate that Chris is acknowledging the discoverability, but that was the first thing that came to my sure. mind when I heard the news. I was like, that's awesome. That's great. 
but Where how uh, but now how are you helping those uh independent developers with the very real challenge of discoverability yeah. it's you know um it's next to impossible and no one's getting it quite right mm-hmm. I and mean, it's hard to find stuff you know to be discovered necessarily on the psn without yeah. spending oh. money yeah right and that's really Even then, that's tough right i mean it, it, yeah. it is like yeah there's only a few featured spots in that store in a di- we were talking about this yesterday di- with danny dialing into the new releases on psn isn't as easy as it should be it right. is very hard and then it is dlc on top of games unless you want to sort but how would you know to sort in both yeah games? exactly right and it's not super intuitive um it's not as difficult maybe as some uh, feel. Sure. But, you know, and... And, while and like you're saying, it's everybody's problem. Steam has too many games. The Switch every Thursday now has 18 games coming to it. Xbox has exactly. its own problem. Yeah, so I think that, you know, just collectively uh, um, from a console or platform provider, right, um, in the digital sense for Steam is it'd be great to see them opening up maybe tools that would allow... Um, indie developers, especially in these scenarios where you know they're these are indies that are self-publishing in, in a lot of cases, right? Yeah. G- giving them some tools to be able to try and find ways to help drive discoverability. Obviously, I don't know what the answer is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't. Yeah. And I don't know if there is one. Right. Right. Like, there are far smarter people than me that crunch these algorithms and, and try I, and figure it out. And it's the weird thing of with ID at Xbox, you assume it's the shotgun approach it's what adam boys used to always say about the press conferences on a very wide scale of like yeah we're gonna put out you know 300 games coming up here to get us to this uh 800th title but the hope is that taste makers the people like us the people at ign the uh, youtube youtuber x right. are gonna see a game in there that i'm gonna write off there somebody else is gonna see like oh, i'm gonna champion that i'm gonna be all about that because like it happened to me yesterday i went to the idea at xbox event here in san francisco and they had a whole bunch of awesome stuff right yeah. but it was a room full of games and it is that point it was just like when i went to indie mix night on friday or monday night here in san francisco uh i walk the aisles Look at every game for a little bit and then figure out which are like the three, four, five that I need to go play. Right. Right. Because you can tell at a glance of, oh, that's a cool thing. Not my kind of game. Not what I need to demo right now. But like, you know, yesterday I jumped in and played Flipping Death. And that was after I walked around and I came back and I saw it and I was like, this art style is really good and the text seems really funny. Just sit down and put them. I'm like, yep, this is totally at my alley. This is totally awesome. And then there was Earthfall. I I, I was walking around yesterday and I think it was Jeff Rubenstein who grabbed me or Will Tuttle made me. It was just like, it's basically Left 4 Dead. And I went over and watched and played. Oh, yep, this is Left 4 Dead. I am all in. And so I left that event now, that ID at Xbox event, knowing those are the two games I'm going to talk about in the shows and those are the two games I'm going to talk about on Twitter and Hopefully, everybody else in a perfect world went through that and saw the games that I was like, oh, not for me. That was for them, and they right. get to go do it. But you're not, it's so hard to like look at that, and I think everybody wants to be on Xbox Super Meat Boy, right? And have this amazing day, and we're on the top of the store, and everybody knows us and is watching us and playing yeah. us. And I don't know in 2018 how easy that is to do anymore. It's uh, it's hard. I mean, to the, your point, I mean, every week, Switch alone getting mm-hmm. 18 titles, right? So that's a lot of noise happening on a weekly basis. I, I love what, um, you know, Jeff in particular, I mean, he's a friend, full disclosure, but I lo- yeah, but I, I like that. I hate him. Do you? <laughs> no, I love him. <laughs> Zombie blog now. Come on. Original podcast. Um, but man. I love how, you know, they do broadcast, con- you know, they, they do broadcasts um, on, on their end um, and, you know, they're actually creating content that's talking about games on, on a routine basis. So maybe it'd be interesting to see them maybe cycle some of these indie developers well, through and give and them some the, camera time. That could be the power of that Xbox show, right? right. Like, I think that as they It'd keep doing that and they find their comfort level and where they go, they do have a platform to be like, yeah, here are the things. But it gets weird of then, is that their place as Xbox people to say, I'm profiling these four games? Because right. then there are hundreds of other games yeah. you're ignoring. And I don't know how to balance that. And I think that's what the official channels for anything run into and that it gets tr- yeah, a little no, bit of a struggle, sure. right? Because I've, I've been on the blog cast a bunch of times and, you know, I think, you know, it's pretty clear. They talk about things they like. They're not going to get critical about something. So then it does become like, how do you pick and choose? How do you play everything? And that's the other thing is you can't do anymore, right? Even like me being a PlayStation guy and like, you know, having covered PlayStation forever. Yeah. I, fuck. Every day we read games on here that I'm like, that's a weird title and I never think or see it. Right. I never play it. I never think about it again. And I never see it in the store. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's, it's impossible. What, what what was that game yesterday with its a weird minesweeper vibe that maybe was kind of porny? I don't know, <laughs> but I don't even remember what it was called and I'll never see it again. Right. Yeah. It's a struggle right now to try to be on top of everything because I remember, you know, you and I were dinosaurs here, right? Video yes. games, you know? But I remember when I started in like 2007, 2008, like 
you could legitimately play everything. You could legitimately yeah. have, if you're covering one platform, totally, I could tell you about everything. I've touched this a little bit. I've done that a little bit, blah, blah, blah. But like PlayStation, once it all went digital, there was just this stream of content and games that you just can't keep up to. Yeah. Right? No, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's an onslaught for sure, yeah. which is great um, on some level for the end, you sure. know, for the fans and the end users. But if they don't know it's there and yeah. they don't know how. Yeah, it's always for me, I, I you know, how many games do come out that should have been my cup of tea? I kind of wish I don't there see. was. I kind of wish there was like a Goodreads, but for video games. Sure, maybe there is, and, I, and I'm just ignorant. Well, so I mean, that's the thing. In the is comments, like, maybe the problem. The problem would be right is the fact that it exists. It's just so fractured, which I think's one of the powerful things. But we miss. I miss the callback too when it was an IGN platform team, and you could listen to Beyond or Three Red Lights or whatever, yeah. and you kn- you could hear an NVC. You'd know everything happening in that space, and we would have touched or played or had a, a preview of every game there. Yeah. Whereas now it's like, I think you have to go on YouTube, go to Patreon, go to a podcast service, and be like, man, I'm I love JRPGs, so I need to find the JRPG person right. that only reviews that stuff, and like. That's where it gets hard, and you then you see something that has to be mainstream, like Persona, like Nino Kuni 2, that then breaks out of that and is everyone's talking about right. it, right? Everyone's talking about Monster Hunter right now because it's gone above and beyond what people expect from that genre. So even it does it doesn't know it's not the old classic preview of fans of the genre will appreciate, sure. right? It's like no fans of video game will see something in this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just like the idea. I mean, you know, I use the PSN uh, in this fashion to you know, oh, uh, folks like yourself where I'm PSN friends, I'll go and I'll see what games you've been playing, right? Where you've been putting time when I'm trying to decide yeah. what I should yeah. tackle next because yeah. there's so much and and that works, but it's not. It's kind of clunky. Um, because I don't think that that's the intended use per se. Yeah. Right. Um, but it'd be nice maybe to have somebody who aggregates and just whitelists, every, you know, all those platforms, and you can then start finding like-minded people. Yeah. And see what they're playing. I yeah. Know. yeah. It's, it's the brave new world we all have to wrestle with and figure it all out, right? Right. And you just want to keep making stuff. You want to keep jumping in there. Yes. Wah. Too many games. Right. Yeah. Wah. Yeah, way too many games. It's just not a perfect world. Ooh. Before I get to number two, uh, Nick Scarpino from KindOfFunny.com, you seem to have something to bring to the table. Uh, yes, thank you, Nick Scarpino. Yeah. Scarpino, yeah. I'm yeah. Like from oh, sure. I'll have my normal. I'll have my normal. My normal. Thank you, my normal order. Uh, Christian, would you like anything from Chipotle? No, I am good. Thank you very much. You're a good man, Nick. Yes. Rough day around here. No internet. Everybody's panicking. Thank you, buddy. Number two on the Roper Report. Another one I want your opinion on. All right. There is a cool new Hollywood video game IP idea. We're back to gamesindustry.biz. Developers around the world now have access to a handful of classic silver screen properties thanks to a competition launched by Unity. The engine provider has partnered with NBC Universal to run the Universal Game Dev Challenge, which kicked off at GDC 2018 in San Francisco this evening. Also supporting the initiative are Microsoft and Intel, who will provide technical support and mentorship for the participants. The challenge is to create a new game concept based on one of the five Universal-owned IPs, Back to the Future, Battlestar Galactica, Jaws, DreamWorks, Voltron Legacy Defender, and Turok. Developers have just one month to pitch a game concept ID, I'm sorry, a game concept via a design document and video, after which a panel of judges will choose six semifinalists. These studios must then create a vertical slice of their concept, competing for the grand prize later this year. The winner will receive $250,000 cash and a consulting contract with Universal, plus, of course, the task of evolving their slice into a full product. That is an awesome idea. It is. I it, actually, it's it's clever. It's new. Yeah. Right. I think it's great. It's a it's taking game jam and turning it outside. Right. I, I think it's an I think it's an insanely great idea. What I love about it is someone uh, universal in this. I think understanding we have cool IP and what we we don't need to go team up with EA other AAA publisher developer, we can go and find smaller indies and make smaller titles and turn them faster and probably make more money. Yeah, and too, like with some of these IPs, it's entirely possible that this is maybe for them, they see it, Universal sees it more as a marketing, um, like, you know, low-key marketing execution of trying to understand maybe where ne- the next reboot might come. Yeah. Where, where there's an appetite for this IP amongst sure. gamers that yeah, then yeah, might yeah. translate into... 
either a Netflix, right? Yeah. You know, how a lot of content is being created that way right now. So well, it's just I feel like we've gotten so many licensed property games that are just not good in the past, right? Yeah. And then it it, it when tr when Double A fell away, like your THQs fell away, and we'll get to that in a second. Sure. Uh, I love that topic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. When those all fell away, you lost those licensed things, and so. On the one hand, it's been great because you get stuff like, hey, we're Marvel and let's team up with Insomniac and PlayStation and make Spider-Man, which looks like that's going to be fantastic. Right. Or, you know, let's let's play with the properties. Interesting. We're WB. Let's get, get Batman and make a whole series with Rocksteady. Awesome. But the problem is then I feel that people in, in, on that side of the industry, on the Hollywood side or IP side, sleep on the fact that. I look at it Insomniac and it was like, man, Sunset Overdrive, what a beautiful game with great gameplay that nobody played. You know what I mean? That just did not deliver because nobody cared about that IP. No, it was new. Nobody's into it. Right. But you take somebody, you see a game, you're like, man, you're a talented studio. I'd love to see you work with a property people care about. It's the same thing here of like, man, what would Drinkbox do with Battlestar Galactica? Sure. Yeah. What would IndieX dev that you loved over here that's made something great do with Back to the Future? How do they expand that lore in a way that's more like Florence and not like telltale if we're just telling you this a different story in this world like yeah. there's a million ways that like you could do something fun and different and outside the box and make a bigger splash i think than just going like cool we have a console pc game that's in this world that's jaws right yeah that's gonna be fascinating I no know. i think it's great i mean i find it a little interesting that part of the reward is going to be a consulting gig with nbc universal so that that should be interesting yeah to see how that plays out but everything about this is just great and uh david jaffe Oh, I know you're listening, bro. Let's get back on that horse, man. We need you. What is he talking about? Not doing getting back on the horse? No, I don't know. Oh, okay, okay, okay. We, you know, we haven't heard anything from yet. And, yeah, I missed you know. totally. I was on va or I was on vacation, or uh, probably honestly, I was working. I don't think I was on vacation, but I missed the thing when it was like, oh yeah, well, we're we're closing up shop, and yeah. then it was later on the the auction when they auctioned off all their stuff. I was like, wait, what is happening? Well, it, it, if I'm not mistaken, David or others can correct me, but I think it was actually a giveaway. It was they weren't looking to raise money. They were uh -huh. they were actually just giving fans. Stuff. Oh, that's awesome. That they okay. could come by the studio and yeah. um and it was a way to just thank the fans for supporting drawn to, drawn to death uh, as much as they did and for yeah. supporting obviously Bartlett Jones. So. I mean, this is right up his alley because he, he put up that uh the little design doc they did of like well, how they had a pitch for that they never actually had the license, but they yeah. thought of making an Iron Man VR yeah. game and talking to Jarvis through the VR headset. And I'm right. like, that is fucking amazing. Exactly. That and that's the kind of weird shit I would love to see. Yeah, I've so, played Back to the Future games. I let's what can you do with that outside of the normal? Right. Yeah. 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 No, absolutely. So I think yeah, this would be great. And this should be some interesting content coming. Good. I right hope on. they release it all. The, I want to see everything people submit. Come on, David. Number three on the Roper Report. Every tweet at David Jaffe. Tell him this is for him. Number three. Not, the, not number three, but the thing we were just talking about. You knew that, but I'm explaining over it was. Number three. <laughs> uh, Nintendo's killing it. I have two stories, uh, both pretty brief, but in the wheelhouse there of Nintendo. Over on gamesindustry.biz. The only site we need to look at anymore. Clearly. The success of the Nintendo Switch continues unabated as the console handheld hybrid completed its first 12 months on the U.S. market. According to the data, Data from the NPD group, the device has now achieved more year one sales than any other console in history. While no figure was specified, it's likely to be well over 5 million as Nintendo reported 4.8 million sales in the U.S. by the end of 2017. However, PlayStation 4 remained the best-selling console in February as well as year-to-date. Also with NPD starting to drop out Monster Hunter on top of the, down, or the uh, NPD list again for the most popular game. Talk to me about that Switch. Uh, it's an... Uh, it's an amazing console. I mean, my fam, my family bought me mine. Yeah, they've never, you know. And trust me, games have put food in their stomachs, mm -hmm. clothes on their back. Mm -hmm. But you know, if I'm playing a game on a console, it's a lot of groans in my home, right? So <laughs> the fact that they gave me a Switch when it released um, told me just how well Nintendo speaks. Yeah. Just on a broad basis. Yeah. And then, I mean, it's just, it, it's awesome. Yeah. I love it. I, I take mine with me everywhere. 100%. It's yeah, it's incredible. Yeah, it's it's funny what you're talking about. I remember when you know we were so dialed into the Switch and all this stuff, but I remember when I went back to Missouri before launch of Switch, and yeah, it was I think it was right after they put out the announcement of the name and the trailer and the you know them on the rooftop switching it up, and I went back to Missouri and hung out with some friends who have kids and have nothing to do with video games and like young kids, not like these kids are finding out like you know or yeah. watching videos, and they were she was just like oh yeah, and what's this new Nintendo? And I was like right. how do you know about this thing exactly. that just got announced last week? But that is Nintendo that it permeates that way, and that was the canary in the coal mine of like are they 
do they have a chance to do this again? Is it gonna get bigger than like we thought it was? Because I, I when I heard about it, I was like, that's a great idea. We were presentation conference. We were like, mm. and then it was like when it got here, it was like, no, no, this is fantastic, and we yeah. love this, and put everything on it. Yeah, no, I think that uh, too. You know, it's probably cyclical a bit, and that um, a lot of those folks that bought the Wii and then you know maybe never bought more than yeah. one or two games yeah. or, or the Wii Fit, you know, uh, for mom um, and dad at home. But the uh, that same group is probably now. They know about this, right? They've heard heard about about it. it. And and it's, that's the great thing that, you know, I started my career at Nintendo. One of the things that I always loved is that they think about the end user experience so much and, and about making it truly, um, accessible and approachable. Sony would, you know, we'd spent, you know, countless hours, um, uh, you know, on a daily basis, it felt like trying to think about accessibility, right? Uh, yeah. Like take a game like the show, which to the uninitiated might feel super complicated with all the control sure. schemes and everything, right? So the way Nintendo is able to just deliver that simplicity, yeah, I, f- I, f- I fucking love it. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome to see them doing well. It's awesome to see. I think them again I think the reason PlayStation was so successful with PlayStation 4 is doubling down on games and doubling down on gamers right it wasn't yep. it definitely is a system that's for everybody but it was very much like here's obviously an amazing line a first party lineup for year one here's all these awesome oh, indies we're going to have it supported with and that brought in triple our trip other triple a partners now and third parties that are actually interested in it and then yesterday again with them delivering on that Nindi- switch presentation again for an indies like right they've got it man yep. and speaking of all that Kotaku has the top 10 indies on the Switch. These are in no particular order, but the top 10 best-selling indies on Switch from Damon Baker, of course, the guy leading up the Nindies charge over there. I'm not sure if Tim's announced this, but he's doing the Gamescast with us tomorrow. We're very excited. Uh, Patreon.com slash games. You can watch it for a buck if the internet's working, by the way. <laughs> Anyways, no order. Here's what he says. The top 10 best-selling indies on the Switch are SteamWorld Dig 2, Stardew Valley, Cameco, Celeste, Fast RMX, Golf Story, Enter the Gungeon, Overcooked, NBA Playgrounds, and Shovel Knight Treasure Trove. Some great games on there. Celeste, come on now. I'm surprised at NBA Playgrounds. The rest all makes sense. <clears throat> Not only just because it's, you know, sports and a little more, yeah, maybe yeah. more niche, but yeah. Didn't have a, a rough launch, too, if memory serves. Something yeah. happened. They had to patch it in later. But I think it was just a, it was like, hey, it's almost NBA Street. And everybody's like, oh, fuck. Yeah. I want that. Yeah, exactly. you know what I mean? I miss that Yeah, game. that's great. Because, yeah, if you can take something like that and make it, you know. Assess- accessible again right. and make it interesting but yeah I'm happy to see Stardew on there happy to see Celeste happy to see Golf Story happy to see Under the Gungeon Love Overcooked obviously Shovel Knight come on but that's a good diverse selection you know what I mean yes. not just indies that we've heard about before or something I'm glad to see something out there doing cool stuff yeah and as a and as a developer when I look at that and I see that breadth yeah and that diversity you know we're looking to develop for Switch as sure. well and so that's you know always encouraging yeah to see and that appetite's there because you know, that's great that they have that many units, but if they're all to just play Super Mario Kart 8. Yeah, 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 of course, yeah. They, 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 have, a, they have attach rate for Odyssey <laughs> and Zelda, and that's it, and they're yeah, gone. Yeah, so no. that would be interesting uh, to hear from someone like Damon is, you know, what is Nintendo planning to announce any tie ratios mm, mm, mm. for that, yeah. you know, that console yeah. um, install base? Because that'd be interesting to see. Yeah, I, I, what I'm still fascinated about is I keep waiting for the bottom to fall out. Like I was telling Danny, of like, cool, we're gonna keep putting 18 of these Switch indies on there, or Switch titles on there every every Thursday. When do we see the story? I, I thought it would already have happened, but you keep seeing the story. Hey, this this our Switch version has outsold all the other versions combined. Yeah. It's like, well, clearly Discovery is rough to an extent, but the cream is rising. Yes. People are seeing what they want. There are people out There's there championing hunger. stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Switch is such a fascinating beast right now. Uh, yeah, I love it. I, I I'll be curious to see too how many of um those uh, switch um, handhelds are active. Yeah, that are actually getting up and turning on and yeah. getting their firmwares yep. and stuff. Yeah, but yeah, that's it. I, I love the speed. Number four on the Roper Report. THQ Nordic is teaming up with Nickelodeon. Kind of. I mean, they're they're buying a bunch of stuff. And this again, THQ Nordic. Just dead set on being THQ again, and I don't fucking understand it, but I digress. Let's read the story, uh, gamesindustry.biz. In a continuation of its strategy to bring back the previous THQ portfolio, THQ Nordic has announced today the revival of multiple licensed Nickelodeon games. A total of 16 old titles will be returning to for international sale, save the fairly odd parents, which will be US only. The full list of returning games is as follows. Avatar The Last Airbender, Back at, back at The, Barnyard, Cat Scratch, 
Danny Phantom, El Tigre, Invader Zim, Jimmy Neutron, My Life as a Teenage Robot. Uh, I think that, yeah, I think that's right. Mm-hmm. There's a comma in there, but I think that's yeah, uh, something I've heard of place. before. Yeah. Uh, Rocket Power, Rocco's Modern Life, Rugrats, SpongeBob SquarePants, Tack and the Power of Juju, The Fairly Odd Parents, US only, The Ren and Snippy Show, and The Wild Thornberries. Yeah, I thought that might get to, that might get Cool Greg up and running. Yeah, you're about that one, Cool Greg. Wild Thornberries. I mean, just in general, the Nickelodeon games. What's your what? Danny Phantoms. Danny, Danny Phantoms. Phantoms the yeah, one that was cool. a good show. My kids, uh, my kids, um, hit me to a lot of these. Um, I've been very vocal about THQ Nordic and that I don't understand what they're doing and why they've done anything. But Jared wrote in to kindoffunny.com slash KFGD, just like you can to be part of the show. I'm going to let him take it from here. Happy GDC to all. My question is, what the actual fuck is THQ Nordic? <laughs> I remember when they first came out, people said they were doomed by associating their brand with a dead one, but here they are. Several game releases and a successful acquisition of Koch Media. And na- or is it Koch? Koch? Koch, Koch no. Media? Koch? Koch Media? Koch, yeah, like the Koch in Brothers? In German, it's Koch. Okay, yeah. Coke, uh, Coke Media. And now they are bringing back Nickelodeon games from the dead. Do you guys have any insights to the mythical creature of a company? Because I can never predict what crazy thing they do next. P.S. We need a battle for a bikini bottom on the Switch ASAP. You are in the industry. Battle for bikini what, bottom. what is going on? What is, why, what is THQ Nordic's plan here? So, um, fold, uh, I, I guess I should caveat that I don't know the folks running. Oh, sure. Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah. THQ Nordic. Um, so not really sure that I'm, you know, well enough educated to know the money behind it, Yeah. but that's where I would start. Okay. Right. So I'm going to just make what I think is probably a safe assumption mm-hmm. that it was initial, um, investment money from outside the game industry that came in. Okay. Right. And so what they're looking to do is build value very quickly. One of the quickest ways you can do that is with branding. Okay. Right? Good or bad, we're talking about them right now. Yeah. They get your attention. Anytime they put out a piece, you come and you rant about them. So I do, yeah. So they're getting the minutes, right? You're yeah. giving them clout. Okay. You're giving them clout, as the kids say, I hear. Yeah, they do. Right? A lot of kids on the street talking about clout. Yeah, well, they're, you know, so they're finessing you for some clout. Okay. I'm, try- I'm just trying to sound cool. Now though. you're just doing it. Yeah, you're doing, uh, it. You're doing anyway, it. Anyway, but yeah, you know, I think that that's probably a big part of it, right? So they do that. And then um, there is an under an unserved market right now for these titles. No one else is building them. There, that's what I'm saying, right? There is none of that mid tier stuff. There, the licensing right. mid tier stuff has gone away. Yeah, and so it was oversaturated oversaturated before. THQ really was king of that space. Yeah, right. So it would make sense that if investment money is coming from the outside and there's the ability to latch on to a brand that was king in that space, and you see a vacuum now, and you're trying to fill that void. Yeah, why not? I just it's the best I could do. I just feel like we're in such a different place in the industry where it's like, I think the indies and people being creative are doing so well that like, unless they're going to, I mean, don't get me wrong. It'd be rad if they get all these properties and stuff and they're like, you know what? We're taking an awesome indie developer and they're making it a Rugrats game of how they and like, sure. Right. Okay, great. But I worry more. It's going to be these old school door of the Explorer games that were just like, why, why is this happening? Yeah. And why I, am I reviewing that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. And that, and that's fair too. I think that what, uh, what'll be interesting is to see what is their approach to tapping developers. Yeah. Right. Um, it's getting, it's, uh, Mobile development right now is. I, I heard I, I was in um, a gathering of um, uh, leaders of independent development companies at the start of the week, and uh, one of the comments that came out of it was that mobile development is up three x. Oh wow! Really? So at that point, you start asking yourself, well, why am I doing it for handsets? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Why? And you look at the success of Switch. And you look at how the switch skew for a lot of people over indexes over any other skew. So then it starts uh, maybe creating a whole new pool of development talent that you can tap into. Okay. Folks who are super um, well versed and skilled in understanding mobile development, um, free to play and games as a service business models, things like that, that have chops and with with the strength of engines now like Unity and yeah. Unreal that cross over between console and um, mobile, it, it allows them to very quickly, I think, uh, get, get teeth okay. in console development. So it's got to be a market that's not served. It's going to be fascinating. I mean, as long as I guess, they don't make you draw again, I guess they'll be all right. Like, that's what investment dudes, all they're doing is building a five year plan to then sell. Mm, mm, right. So they got to yeah. build. And so they're going to build up the portfolio. They're going to build all this value. And then we'll see what they do with the company. Okay. Someone Stay tuned, everybody. Stay tuned. Uh, I'll tell you what. 
I do hope that we get SpongeBob Bikini Bot Battle for Bikini Bottom over on Switch. Oh yeah, I'd but play if we it. do, Christian, yes. it's going to happen so long from now. Yes. If I wanted to know what came to the digital mom and grop shops today, where would I go? Where would you do? The official list of upcoming software across each and every platform, as listed by the kind of funny games daily show host each and every weekday. <laughs> yeah. I miss Kevin. And not, not that you're doing a bad job, Cool Greg, but you know, that's when me and Kevin make eye contact. We do the yeah together. Kevin deserves a day off, though. Out today, you can get Bridget. Or is it Brigitte? Brigitte. I don't know. The newest support character for Overwatch is now available on PC, PS4, and Xbox One as part of Blizzard's next update for the game. Bad Dudes is on Switch. Lunar Stone, Origin of Blood, is on PlayStation VR. The account, Lucanor. The Count Lucanor is on Xbox One. Where Are My Friends is on PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. That sounds interesting. And then World of Warriors is also on PlayStation 4. And I got no new dates for you. That's a rare one. I didn't see anything popping off today. I'm getting sick of these people announcing their games are coming and they're like, it's coming springish. I'm like, no, well, no, that's not really an announcement. Give me the date. Yeah. You know, don't press release me on this unless you have a date. <laughs> annoying. Of course, they could be annoying like Insomniac, though, and just say nothing. Just say nothing. Let us all twist in the wind. Now it's time for reader mail. But first, I'm going to tell you it's brought to you by Brooklinen and Hims. Let's talk about Brooklinen.com. You spend a third of your life in your sheets. You need to make a difference with how you start sleeping. So why not start sleeping on some better sheets? Brooklinen.com is an amazing little site that gives you great sheets. I am sleeping on them right, right now. I can tell you this. They're comfortable. Mm -hmm. They're pretty. They take good photos when I put Porty on them. You go to Instagram.com yes. slash Game Over Greggy. You see Porty on the bed. That's a Brooklyn sheet. What I liked about him, Christian, yeah. was the fact when you go to the site, you pick, you know, what size bed you have. Sure. And then you start going between the colors and they start changing the sheets as you click on everything. Mm -hmm. So you can see what the sheets look like with the comforter. And as I've said, what nice. I did is I was able to put it with the white comforter with the blue navy dots on it and then the navy sheets. And then I just brought it home and I knew it looked good. Jen thought it looked good and she was impressed. I knew how to do it without her help. You're a style maven. You know what I mean? I'm a renaissance man, as they say. Uh, there's no unnecessary markups and fees with brooklinen.com. Of course, most betting is marked up as much as 300%. Uh, Brooklinen, you can match and mix uh, to complement any decor. This is luxury betting underpriced, and you have to try these sheets today. Uh, brooklinen.com has an exclusive officer just for, uh, offer, not an officer, just for my listeners. You can get $20 off and free shipping when you use the promo code GAMESDAILY at brooklinen.com. Brooklinen is so confident that they offer a risk-free 60 night satisfaction guarantee and a lifetime warranty on all their sheets and comforters. The only way to get $20 off and free shipping is to use the promo code GAMESDAILY at brooklinen.com. That's B-R-O-O-K-L-I-N en.com promo code games daily brook linen these are the best sheets ever a strong tagline and i appreciate it yeah next sponsor hymns did you know 66 percent of men lose their hair by the age 35 but the thing is once you notice it's too late to do anything about it that's Word. why hymns is here to fix it you 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 have you, you you struggling i feel incredibly fortunate i'm uh, i'll be 49 this year thank you and uh, I'm, I think I'm going to hold on to what I got. You so look good. I'm good. You look good. Thank you. Yeah, here's the thing. Nick is terrified of losing his hair because he's already lost a whole bunch of it. So yeah. what he did is he's doing hymns right now. Him and Andy signed up for hymns. Of course, hymns does uh, the hair stuff. It does personal care products. It does male stuff. And then uh, you can see, you go on the thing. You send them photos of yourself if you're doing the hair stuff. They tell you they have like the consult the consulting thing. They mm -hmm. talk to you if you need actual medication from it. They'll link you up with a doctor that you can do consulting online right on. stuff. Then they send it to you. So. That's what 4 is all about. It's a solution. 4Hims.com is a one-stop shop for hair loss, skin care, sexual wellness for men. Thanks to science, baldness can be optional. Another great line. Not a tagline, but a good line. That is good. Him connects you with real doctors and medical-grade solutions to treat hair loss. Well-known generic equivalents to name-brand prescriptions to help you keep your hair. You, my listeners, can order now and get a trial month for, of 4 Hims just for $5. Right now, while supplies last, you have to see the full website for details. Uh, this would cost hundreds if you went to a doctor or pharmacy. So Go to forhims.com slash games daily. That's F O R H I M S dot com slash games daily. Forhims.com slash games daily. They don't have an impressive tagline yet. That's their, I don't know, man. Their uh, baldness is optional. That's pretty good. Right? Yeah, that, yeah, was, yeah. that was For pretty Hims, tight. Yeah. Baldness is optional. Yeah. yeah. Thanks to science. <sighs> I'm a fan of science. Science is pretty cool. You know what I mean? It's kind of my jam. Um, here, let's do this. This isn't even a question as much as a shout out from George. All right. George writes into kind of funny.com slash KFGD and says, Hey, Greg, 
No question here. Just wanted to give you a heads up as you've spoken about it on the show previously. WWE has announced that their most recent pay-per-view is available in VR via the next VR app. Thought this may interest you depending on response. It could definitely be a factor that gets me to hop on the VR train. I will definitely check that out. I know the next app, they partnered up with WWE to put moments on there. I didn't realize the whole uh, PPV was up there. You're in this VR space. I am. How is it going? It's actually going well, very well. I think that, you know, um, what what we've been seeing inside the PSVR effort um, that we did with uh, Sony on Starblood Arena, mm-hmm. as well as some of the VR work that we do um, outside of there that has to do with n- non-game um, entertainment yeah. consumption is, it's everything's moving forward. I, 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 I got um, an appointment to be able to check out the Santa Fe um, demo um, from Oculus, their oh, new okay, okay. Uh, untethered headset. So oh. looking forward to checking that out yeah, this yeah, week, because yeah. um, that's the next that's the next step. Yeah, uh, we, we've got to get to the point where we're not tethered. Yeah, there's no barriers to entry, Absolutely. right? Because that's my thing of like. Uh, do I want to yeah. drag the cables out and move the couch or move the coffee table and do all these different things? If it's just sitting off to the side, right, and you pop it on. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, at, at Whiteman, we, we mess around a lot with uh, the VR tech. Um, we're, we, we're really focused on user comfort. That yeah. is a big reason for Starblood for us is, you know, we wanted to make sure that when we give six degrees of freedom of movement, that it doesn't make you sick yeah right um, yeah. i'm not at sony anymore so i can say that now. Yeah, yeah of course right? yeah, yeah. um uh, and n- now we're really uh we're spending a lot of uh time uh working on locomotion mm. and being able to walk around in first person yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. um and it and we've got it feeling amazing um g- great uh demo that we brought to gdc that we're showing okay. so it's great has vr Met your expectations, exceeded them, underperformed. Like you were, you were obviously at PlayStation when they started shopping this idea around, right? Yeah, yeah. No, I was fortunate that I was allowed to be, um, you know, included in the very initial um, conversations when Mick Hawking, who really championed it initially, and then Shu obviously yeah. stepped up and became the real um, banner leader for that initiative. Yeah, in San Diego, we had people that were obsessed with the VR space. And so we were able to commit um, time from us and everything from giving feedback on the design of the headsets to um, helping with the the firmware and the SDK. And so back to your question, I I think it's meeting my expectations. I'm a little worried that um, that maybe some of um, the big investors in this space might get a bit of cold feet. Sure. But I think that what we need are moments like these, right? Where we're bringing entertainment content yep. to a VR experience that's not necessarily game, that then helps people understand that this is a great way to be able to consume it. It's not, you don't have to just play games, I guess. Right. right. No, and 100%. it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, this is, I mean, I was super, when WDB announced this, we put it in here and we were talking about it. And I was like, this is what I've been saying, blah, blah, blah. And I was shocked that some people wrote into you wrong, being like, well, no, the next VR app already does that with NBA games. Like, yeah. you can, and I was like, how do I not know this? Yeah. As a guy who's actually excited about VR, does the PlayStation VR show? Like, where, how is that getting lost in the shuffle that, hey, this device you have that you think about right now, somebody who bought it as, Every so often there's a cool game or there's a cool experience and yeah. I'll put it on. There's like there's a really cool experience happening right now that might be in your wheelhouse depending on what your, your outside games interests are. Absolutely. If you're a baseball fan, uh, the folks at MLB.com and, yeah. and MLB Advanced Media, it's that same entity, they're first and foremost they're technologists that happen to love baseball. Yeah. Um, and they, the work that they've been doing in VR is, uh, I think, really impressive as well. A lot of uh, getting to be in the stadium and be able to just sure. pick a seat yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and see what the view is going to be from the seat before you buy it. Yeah, it's yeah, amazing yeah, yeah. to be able to watch a game in VR. I think it's cool to be able to be on the field for batting practice because they've got the 360 cameras yeah. set up, right? The, the stuff that they're doing to engage with fans through VR, I think, is setting them up to be way ahead of all the other organized sports. And that's why, uh, you know, I've talked about it on, I know for listeners So shout the show. out to Jamie Lees. What if Jamie Lees? Good job. Uh, I know I've talked about it, so I don't want to be that horse for everybody who listens to everything we do, which is a lot of you, and we thank you. But, like, the fact that the PlayStation E3 or PSX conference doesn't have a, 
here's front row VR cam, here's a cam backstage or on the side, here's a cam we put up with the microphone so you can see what it's like. Because like I'm lucky enough and you're lucky enough that we've been on those stages. We know what that feels like and looks like and it's an incredible feeling and I think it'd be awesome to let somebody go up there and be that person while absolutely who's whoever plays last of us or whatever shuhei says something right and like i think it's such a cool value add to this device of like we're supporting it with games we're you know and we want developers to be a part of it but we're also on our own doing these cool things yeah yeah yep i like VR. good stuff i hope it sticks around we're doing our best to make that okay, happen well we'll make sure whenever you can actually announce any of your gosh darn games you gosh know, darn. addison scott psn juggle man writes in to kind of funny.com slash kfgd and says he has a possible solution for crunch. And I'd like your opinion on this. Oh. I'm currently reading through the story from The Verge about Telltale and video game development in general, and it got me thinking. Did you see this Verge story yesterday? We put it out as required reading here. Yeah. The article discusses crunch time at video game studios and how crunch destroys developers' mental, physical, and social health. With the recent popularity of inclusion riders in the movie industry, can something similar be done in the games industry, but related to crunch time instead of diversity? Could media outlets say something like, quote, we will only create content for games that are developed by companies that provide a written statement that their employees work no more than XX hours per week. Is that a, is that a solution to crunch time? Um, Mario time, as some call it. Uh, so, uh, all, all due respect, no. Yeah. Um, I, but I understand the spirit of what they're saying, and I sure. think that I, I think that they're they're looking in the right uh, they're looking in the right direction. But yeah. I don't know that that's necessarily the solve. What what I love, and you know, this is how I am at, at work as well. Is you know, I'm not really interested in shots across bows when you point out problems. If you can't at least come with a, a possible, possible solution, fix, it doesn't yeah. have to be the right one, but at least show that you're thinking about fixing it not just complaining not so, just walking and be like this sucks yeah exactly so i think that this is great i think that movie industry can get away um well not get away that makes it that sounds wrong right but it's easier to institute i would say it's yeah. easier to institute right because of unions yes that's exactly where i was going yeah. so uh, we're not a union um industry uh, probably never will be yeah so um, every so often it seems like it gets kicked up somebody's talking like about yeah it. there'll be a little talking then i think for the most part now it'll be interesting for me to th see it and think about it from the development side sure. and, be, and being a developer but i think that you know, really, at the end of the day, it what could happen is fans could vote with their wallets, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, it's uh, but it's hard to really know uh, the kind of hours that people put in until a, a company starts building a reputation for itself, right? Yeah. I think EA slugged its way out of a horrible reputation for the t and type of hours they put yeah. people through when in reality they weren't any worse than anyone else. Yeah. They just got the spotlight shown on them, yeah, yeah. unfortunately. So it, really a lot of this comes down to um, folks uh, on the development teams themselves and understanding how to maybe improve your project management methodologies, right? Yeah. Be, be able to plan out better. But it's but it is the one thing that I have to leave because and this is why I guess ultimately I said in such definitive fashion no as uh, to this as a solve is you're never going to be able to really put an actual cap on number of hours that you need to create a piece art. of entertainment art yeah, exactly yeah. this is ex experiential it's um it's new it didn't exist before and there's a ton of discovery and discovery leads you do down new hallways and rat holes unfortunately right. and sometimes. that's what slows it down and right? that's what slows it down so what helps in those moments is is, is actually for us as developers to focus uh, mm. back on how are we approaching it and are we being disciplined in the, those moments of discovery yeah Right, so because as an outsider, that's the thing we all, as video game fans, video game consumers, I, mean, I think the the level of educated gamer, like the people who watch this show or listen or read or you know, that want this story, that aren't just buying the box, playing it, and never thinking about it, the people who are engaging this kind of discussion, it is just that balancing act of we want the best game you can make, but we don't want you to kill yourself, but we do want it. We do want it when we want. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, there's this give and take all the time. Of yep. I feel like I've been I've been lucky enough to go behind the scenes and interview developers and do all this stuff. And it seems like every studio that I've been to recently and talked to somebody about crunch time, right? They're like, well, not really, but what it is is, are you getting your work done? And yeah. for some people, that means they come in at seven in the morning and they work till they leave at seven. Some means they come in right before lunch and they're here till three in the morning. Like it's like you're saying a creative yeah. space how do you get creative juices flowing how do you do that and then yeah how do you say all right cool 
this is the release date. We have to go gold here. But as you go, you figure out, oh, whoa, the animations look way better if we do this. Right. How do we make that happen and then still meet that? And sometimes, and this has happened to me a lot over my career, it, a hook um, in the gameplay mechanic yeah. um, surfaces uh, just through discovery. And then you go, oh, shit, let's, let's chase that a little further. Yeah. What, what could that look like if we spend a little bit more time on it? And who knows when that moment's going to surface? Sure, but when it does, you got to do it for the as a creator. Yeah. There's no way that you leave it untouched. You yeah. go, no, I got to, I got to suss this out. And I feel like that's the, another thing I hear from every developer, right? Is like when they're done with a the game, they're never done. No, there's always a million things oh they wish God. they could have done. They know where the bugs are. They know what's wrong. They know how this works. Oh, it's yeah. just yeah, it had to ship. It had to go because yes. otherwise you would work on it forever. It, it, it no game is ever done. Yeah, it's impossible. Video games, they're great. Let's see this. Eh, I, th- I feel like we answered, but I'm going to my dog, Nick 96 from Massachusetts writes in all the time. So I want to give him this one. Yeah. Uh, he says, what up? KFGD crew. I'm an avid gamer and consumer of the mar- of the market. As someone who has attended conventions, I can understand the joy of going to one. What makes GDC so special for you? Have a great GDC, my dog Nick ninety six. Is that camaraderie you talked about? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I you know I I didn't realize how uh, how thirsty I was for some for some industry love. Yeah. Until I got here Monday, and then I just started bumping into person after person, and yeah. I was just like, you know, and the hugs were plentiful, and it was awesome. Yeah. And I was just like, oh shit. That's right. Yeah. This is all I mean, so awesome. I, I drove up, um, you know, Sunday night from San Diego with all of our equipment. Yeah. And I got here and I was grumpy and of tired. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Within 20 minutes, I was grinning like a little kid because yeah. I'd seen a half dozen people I haven't seen in a couple years, maybe. Yeah. So, yeah, it's that industry camaraderie. I'm always so blessed to be at a GDC because obviously I'm not a developer. <laughs> but what I love the most about it is the genuine excitement you all have for either showing your game or talking about it. Like last night, I went to Day of the Devs at Alamo Draft house right yeah and that's such an awesome amazing experience of these small indie devs and some of them are large people <laughs> anyways <laughs> them coming up onto this stage the alma draft house the, you know theater one the g- big theater yeah. having their game on a movie theater screen playing it up there and when a joke hits and everybody laughs or when people clap when something goofy happens and watching them Magical. light up in their excitement of talking to you about this game and being excited yeah. and they can't believe they're showing this game to somebody let alone in a movie theater like that's for me GDC in a, in a nutshell, right? Yep. But then I go out for drinks and I run in, like you're saying, to people I know that are developers and then other people show up and they break out their phones and they're so excited to show each other this new cinematic or this model we just made and all these different things of like, that's that's what it's about, right? And that's yep. what we, I love seeing that because like, I think we're not cursed or anything, but like what we see and I'm hitting myself as a consumer, right, is the, oh, here's the story about Telltale Problem or what's going on at this developer or there's layoffs or the game's out. Congratulations. That's great. And here it's gone gold and they're holding up. the. You don't hear the stories and see right. the enjoyment and see them actually be together and have a moment. And that's what GDC is every year. It's the moment of just like creators being together. And it's not the E3 moment that's also awesome. The E3 moment after a PlayStation press conference is awesome, but it's also the heads of PlayStation, including marketing and this and the other stuff that like respect the game developers, but it's not the environment artist so excited that somebody just told them their exactly. environments are awesome. You yeah, know? Or, yeah, exactly. Or that, you know, the lighting that was in this game yeah. was just surreal, right? The shaders written. Things that, you know, at the end of the day, fans... W- care about yeah but they're not going to instinctively go to versus right. here you know it's great to be able to run into friends that work on games like Fortnite, as an yeah. example oh my gosh yeah right and to be able to go fuck <laughs> congrats <laughs> yeah right, right and on an iphone are you fucking kidding me right yeah, now yeah, yeah. like wow right like to be able to have those moments because they're so sincere and real and to get that kind of response from someone who's in the trenches too yeah doing this shit yeah, on the, exactly. On the daily. Respect. Right. And for Respect. them to just be like, oh my God, and fanboy out a little bit. Yeah. I, that's the other th- great thing for me, too, is to be able to come and fanboy out. Good. Yeah. Let's kick it like over here. to Shane at kindoffunny.com slash KFGD, who writes in and says, What's up, kind of funny bros? I was so happy to hear the positive first reactions for God of War. Firstly, because I'm excited to play it, but secondly, because I pre-ordered the Stone Mason edition that has the cool statue and collectibles. I like displaying nerdy collectibles of things I like. I have so many that I swap them out and do themes. My question is, how are you guys, what, how are your guys' collecting habits? Do you resist getting collectibles for any reason? Are there any collection adi- collector's editions you regret skipping? I regret canceling my Horizon one last year, 
and opting for the standard one instead. As always, thanks for what you do and keep up the awesome work, Shane. How does it work for you? You've been in the industry forever. Yeah. At one point, did you turn off the idea of like the collections and the swag and the knickknacks? Yeah, I, I think. Well, I I realized pretty early on that if I wasn't careful. I'd just be buried. I, I, yeah. I have slight hoarder tendencies, sure. yeah, so yeah, I have yeah, yeah. to police myself. So yeah. yeah, so I'm pretty low key. I try to be honest with you. I actually try to limit it to uh, to uh, games that I've wor- I've actively worked. Oh, on. Oh, okay, interesting, interesting. Right. I just feel like uh, that. I, I'm still a fan of all the other you know opportunities that come along, but for me, it's almost more of a trophy moment. Right? Yeah. That I can go, hey, here's a here's a product. So, you know, although. I didn't work on the show that's coming out uh, here at end of month, but I pre-ordered that. Hell yeah, <laughs> yeah. For me, I, it's I. I remember. I mean, growing up, I I'm collecting comics and toys and all yeah. this stuff. It's so like my dad's attic is packed with long right. boxes full of things that one day I'm gonna have to figure out what to do with. But when I moved to when I went to college and then when I went to San Francisco, like there's just no room. And, it, and right. it's been a it's been a blessing in the way I, I I had to get over that and I don't and even when I buy comics now on singles I'll give them away of like right. cool like I, I mean not the comicsology stuff I keep I keep my trades together but like video game collectors editions I used to be so excited for yeah but it's just so rare to get an awesome one right. and usually when it is it's one part of one that's awesome you know what I mean like I think of like when DC Universe Online was gonna put out this collectors and like yeah and I got it in the Batman statue was like all plasticky and like chintzy you're like oh well. This isn't that great. You know what I mean? <laughs> and then it, it would keep happening of like, well, there's going to be this one. Oh, well, like that infamous one, like, oh man, like you got a statue. It's like not that great. And then they made the real ceramic ones that were yeah. nice and awesome. Those are nice. But like the infamous two collector's edition, right? Like yep. why does that have longevity? Because the bag they gave you is actually a really great bag. <laughs> yeah. And I have two in my closet that are like when I need a shoulder bag, snap it on and go. Like right. I like the stuff that's, uh, you know, has a utility to it. There's sure. going to be a reason for me to use it. Statues and stuff only go so far and like. I usually toss those. Yeah, yeah. Or give them away when I say toss. I don't just throw stuff right. away usually. Yeah, which is what uh, Bartlett Jones did. Yeah. Give them exactly. Okay. Yeah. Full circle. Giving it back. Speaking Call of that. which, Justin writes in to kindoffunny.com slash KFGD. Stick with me. I'll get to why it's a speaking of. Yeah. Uh, it's me again. I, don't, I, I, I didn't read it the first time. I'm sorry, Justin. Oh, I'm not mad anymore. I did. Justin thought he'd be real cute and get re- be mad and like submit a million different questions. Oh. And Justin's questions didn't even get fucking read. Wow. Uh, Justin, though, he came with a real question and says, uh, did, you get, did you get to play Dying Light Bad Blood yesterday? If so, how was it? Thanks, XOXO, Justin. I did. Played, I went down to GDC, played uh, Dying Light Bad Blood yesterday. It's actually really, really cool. Did you like Dying Light the first time around? Did you play it? Have time? Uh, I did not. Okay, so Dying Light, we've all talked about it, And I think, honestly, in... One day when I write my book, no one will read. And I'm not going to I'll do. read it. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, I think Dying Light was the first example of like, oh man, if you put out a game in like end of January, beginning of February, people are starving for games and they will buy it like and give a chance they never did. Yeah. And we've seen it since with uh, oh, so much stuff. Monster Hunter this year being, I think, the key example here. Resident Evil really performing and getting outside of people who are just horror fans. I digress though. Uh, Dying Light was awesome, right? Because of the... it's. Parkour, it was, you know, first person oh, okay, zombie right game. Yeah. Okay, whatever. It's a first person zombie game, but it was the fact that the free running parkour you felt so powerful and engaged and it had this flow to it that was great. And so was the combat and all this different stuff. Oh, and it was just Techland so. doing great stuff. Uh Dying Light Bad Blood is this new multiplayer game they're putting out, which is all the stuff that was awesome about Dying Light with the free running and the weapon crafting and all that jazz, but it's you and, and five other players, so six players total. The idea is that you're on the map. Zombies are everywhere. You have to collect zombie samples from them, blood samples, and then get them and then extract out in a helicopter. The catch is only one. The helicopter only has one seat. So you're playing and you're fighting the zombies, but you can turn on each other at any point and fight each other. You not work together. You can't work together. Like eventually, you're gonna have to turn on each other. When somebody actually gets enough samples, the the helicopters are called in. They go to the evac zone. You have to wait on the evac zone. I think for thirty or forty five seconds, and that's when everybody else comes at you. Now, now it's you know player versus player. Yeah. If I kill you, I can pick up your blood samples and add them to mine and go on this way. It was really fun. I really had a great time with it. I'm excited to get it for party modes with the guys. Yeah, that's uh, awesome. Where I said I'd get back to how this ties into what we're talking about. Yeah. They gave me. <laughs> it's always that thing where like. I've been doing this a long time, so like when they're like, "Oh, don't forget like the press swag bag," you're like, "No, oh, no, I don't want. I don't feel. I feel really rude saying no, so I'll take." It. And it was this giant dead dying light tin or whatever. Yeah. And I got back up and I opened it and it was like, "All right, the T-shirt, a bandana," and then they there was a couple other things and they put in there this flashlight that's also a beacon and has like a magnet on it, so like it's like keeping keep your trunk and if anything ever goes wrong, right. use this flashlight and then put it there. I was like. 
All right, kept that and gave away the rest of the stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, cool, sorry, I'm never going to want to rock at a Dying Light bandana. I know that's awesome for so many fans out there and things like that. It yeah. wasn't my cup of tea, so I found people on the way out to get to. But there you go. Love it. Full circle. Full circle. Christian. Yes, sir. It's time to squad up. This is where somebody writes in to kindoffunny.com slash KFGD, giving me their name, username, platform of choice, and why they need help in a video game. I read it here. The best friends come and find you, and everybody plays games together as one big, awesome community. Today, Today, Marissa needs help on Xbox One. Her gamer tag, mdarcy93. Why she needs help in a video game? She says, yar for that plentiful booty in Sea of Thieves. So if you're playing Sea of Thieves, hit up mdarcy93 and join her lovable pirate crew. Arg. Now, usually we would do your wrong in a second. I'd get the iPad out yeah. and show it to you. We can't do it. I assume we were 100%. But I do have a follow-up to yesterday's segment, Required Reading. More Required Reading. See Flickster. Wrote in to kindoffunny.com slash KFGD and says, Related to yesterday's require reading, required reading and the follow-up question about fostering creativity, I would like to propose another required reading. A book titled Creativity, Inc. Written by Ed Catmull, the president of Pixar, it's an account of how to run a company of creative people and avoid the obstacles created by the work environment itself, despite even the best intentions that squelch creativity. A good book, I think for you in particular, Mr. Greg Miller, as well as the community of content creators within The Best Friends. Sincerely, Cody Flick. Have you read Creativity, Inc.? 10 out of 10. Yeah? Ed Catmull went to high school with my pops. but Oh, really? So he sent me the book. And oh. I was just like, yeah, I rolled my eyes and I started reading and I was like, oh, yeah. this is a really good read. A uh, friend of the show, world famous bartender Eric Castro, Polite Provision, San Diego, uh, tells me every time we're together to read this book. And I bought this book on iPad and I'm too busy working and making all these people work probably the wrong way to read the book to figure out how to make them work better. Get it on Audible. Ooh. I was having a hard time dedicating time yeah, yeah, yeah. to reading. And I found that I was having to go back and you know, sure. Wait, what did I get back yeah, yeah. up? And then I was just like, Fuck, why don't I just get it on Audible? Okay. And boom. There you go. Yeah. It's All right. So that's a good one. Thank you. More required reading is always good. Uh, like I said, no, you're wrong. Usually we'd ask you to do that, but we can't. So we were right about everything. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, this has been Kind of Funny Games Daily. Each and every weekday on a variety of platforms, we run you through the nerdy video game news you need to know about. If you like that, you can usually watch it live on twitch.tv slash kindoffunnygames. You can always watch it later on youtube.com slash kindoffunnygames and listen later on podcast services around the globe, including Spotify. Tomorrow, GDC week continues. Jason Schreier himself from Kotaka will be here. Nice. First question, are you mad that we just read your stories, thus taking down your view counts? <laughs> we'll see. We'll see what he thinks of that. Uh, Christian, uh, thank you. You've, you're great. You've always been a friend. I'm so glad you can come on the shows and do stuff with us. You guys' friendship's awesome, man. I really appreciate the opportunity to come in and hang out. It's what, fun. what can the best friends do for you right now? Wait, wait, the, you, you, your other game's not announced yet. Should they just all go play Star Blood Arena? Yeah, you know what? Um, for any of you who pulled it down when it was a PS Plus giveaway, jump on, play Wednesday nights, the community oh, okay. organites. Sunday nights, the community organizes um, play sessions. What, for a, a nutshell, what is Star Blood Arena? Uh, Star Blood Arena is, think of it as a um, first person shooter where there is no up. Okay. That's a good way to put it. All right. Well, that, is that not entice you enough? Tim, does that entice you? And that's what I like to hear. Eight player PvP. Get okay. in there. Light it up. All right. All right. Christian, I love you. I love you. Ladies and gentlemen, until next time. It's been our pleasure to serve you. R.I.P. Gus.